So before we start, let me just share with you a really important theological idea. It's called the luck of the Irish. You maybe know it by its doctrinal name, which is Murphy's Law. But basically it goes something like this. On the weekend when everybody else in Western Australia gets to take their mask off, I get declared close contact and I got to wear a mask for another week. So frustrating, especially because I'm a hugger. I'm one of those, those people who like to hug and I was super excited about this weekend to meet the Riverview family all over again and to do some serious hugging and it's not gonna happen, so super frustrated. Anyway, glad you're here. If you're a guest or you're a visitor, you're so welcome. We're just a group of very ordinary people that have had an encounter with an extraordinary God who's been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ and we're trying to follow him and we just would love you to come along with us on that journey. We're beginning a new sermon series tonight where we're gonna look together in an Old Testament book called Nehemiah. And I'm really looking forward to these next six weeks while we journey and meander through this old book. I wanna encourage you to open your Bible between Sundays and actually read the text of the story. I think you'll really enjoy it. And we're gonna learn together as a church some really cool and important things for us as a community. Nehemiah is actually a memoir. You know, there's lots of types and genres of literature in the Bible. There are songs and poetry and epistles and history books. And this is a memoir. I don't know if any of you have started working on your memoirs just yet. Anyone give me a wave if you're already working on your memoir. You know, one of the hardest things about writing a memoir is coming up with a really cool name for it. One of the things I discovered this week is that there's actually a website, which is memoirnamegenerator.com, where you can get help for that. So that's really awesome. I've already written the name of a couple of memoirs that I'm gonna get to eventually. I'm thinking the first one might be There and Back Again, A Real Hobbit's Tale by Steve McCready. (laughs) So that's just a little tip of the hat to all my fellow Lord of the Rings fans. But actually, when I write my memoir, I'm gonna call it The Northern Irish Troubles. Now, if you don't know anything about history, I don't expect you to know this, but the war in Ireland was actually called The Northern Irish Troubles. So I'm gonna write my memoirs. It's gonna be called The Northern Irish Troubles, but then like the subtitle is gonna be this. Not being understood while speaking English in an English-speaking country. A memoir by Steve McCready. Because you see, the real trouble with being Northern Irish is that I'm speaking English, but you're not convinced. Right? That's, that's kind of like the story of my life. Now, it's great being at Riverview because there's so many Pentecostals from a bygone era. They just think I'm speaking in tongues and they have been given the gift of interpretation every Sunday. And so they're just loving life. The book of Nehemiah is a memoir. It's a memoir by Nehemiah. It's about a particular part in his story. He's documenting the moment in his life when God invited him into his work in Jerusalem, particularly a very special moment in that work when the walls of Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. God's people were returning from captivity beyond the river in far off kingdoms. They were making their way home to Jerusalem and they had work to do. And Nehemiah was invited to participate in that. And we're gonna read the first 11 verses of Nehemiah tonight. So if you've got your Bible, let's dig in. Don't worry if you don't, the scripture verses are gonna come on the screen behind me. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Now, I don't expect any of you know where Susa was or is, so I'll just, I'll just tell you, it was in Iran. I don't know if you know that part of the Bible was actually set in the ancient kingdom of Iran. Somewhere between Tehran and Baghdad in Iraq was a city, a fortress known as Susa, and that's where Nehemiah was working. Hananiah, who's one of his brothers, comes to him for a visit, and we're told in the text that some other man who had just arrived from Judah came with him. Now, let me explain what's going on there. This is like an old school visit from missionaries. You see, everybody was leaving this region to go to Jerusalem, but we're told that there's a group of men who have left Jerusalem and they've come back. And you gotta try to wrestle with that a little bit and make sense of it. Well, remember back in the 80s and 90s and noughties, you don't do it in churches anymore, but back in the day, we used to invite missionaries to come back from far-flung fields, from 
places like, I don't know, Mongolia and Africa and Ireland and South America. And they would come back to church and they would give us a report about the amazing things that God was doing. And then we would get really excited. Now, as a missionary myself, I can tell you how this goes. Normally when you come back, what you do is you put a positive spin on everything because you want everyone to get really excited about what God's up to. So you tell all the really good stuff and then all the donors get super excited about it because nobody wants to bet on a loser. So they wanna get behind the really exciting stuff and so everybody gives you money. But these missionaries come back and they're coming back to raise money, to raise support. But the story they come to tell is a lot more honest. Nehemiah asks them, how are things going with those who have returned from captivity? How are things going in Jerusalem? And this is what the men report. Things are not going well. They're not going well for those who have returned to the province of Judah. They are in, okay, you're gonna need both hands here. They are in great trouble and they are in disgrace. You got these two things that are going on among God's people. They're in great trouble and they're in disgrace. Why? Like what's going on that's brought them to that part? Well, he actually tells us. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So you got these two ideas. You got a people who are in great trouble. You got a people who are in disgrace. And that's connected to this very next sentence that we read where we're told that the walls are torn down and the gates have been burned. See, in in the ancient world, the walls of a city were its defense. And so without walls, the people of Jerusalem are vulnerable. They are in great trouble. Their community is in a very fragile place. But likewise, without gates, they're, they're not a city that has honor. Honor and respect and leadership all takes place at the gates of a city. You see this the whole way through the Old Testament. The elders gather at the gates of the city. It's how they lead the people. It's where they lead the people from. And there are no gates. This is a people in disgrace. They're living in absolute defeat. Now, I really enjoy Nehemiah's response. When he heard this, He sits down, he says, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Now this should be super encouraging for just about everybody in here that's not a pastor. Because this guy, Nehemiah, is actually just someone that works in the corporate sector. He's just a leader. He's involved in local leadership and politics. He hasn't been to seminary. He's not a professional Christian. He's not being paid to stand on stages and preach and look all spiritual. He's just, he's just one of the people. And yet when the chips are down, we can see from this story that he has the tools in his life to be able to seek after God. He has got the equipment to be able to be spiritually formed. He's a deeply formed man. He knows how to respond, how to seek God. This is super encouraging, especially for a church that's seeking to empower everybody to become ministers of the gospel, that we could all see that this is something that we can all access, spiritual formation, spiritual disciplines in our lives. So he prays and he mourns and he fasts, and then he goes before God with this great prayer. He says, oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. That's a really smart moment here where Nehemiah is appealing to God, not based on his own ability, not based on the grandiose spiritual promises that he's made, but by speaking to the promises that God has made, by reminding God of his word and the things that he has declared over his people. He says, if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, and this idea of returning, turn to your neighbor and say, return, okay? Good, that word return is gonna come back later in this message. That is key to understanding the story of Nehemiah. If you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you're exiled to the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to this place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants, 
Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. And then he goes on, and we're gonna dig into this in a few weeks, where he talks about asking God to pour favor into his life. And then he just finishes by reminding his readers at this point in his memoirs that he's not a prophet or a priest. He's a wine taster, which sounds like the dream job. But his job is to taste the wine for the king, to make sure that it's not poisoned, but to live and to be in that particular role meant that you were a man of influence. We thank God for his word. Give me a wave if anyone in the room knows what Minecraft is. Good, because a few of our services today, I could just tell there's a whole bunch of people going, don't know what that is, Steve. I made the mistake once of thinking that Minecraft was just for kids until in my last church, I met a man who was a professional Minecrafter in his 40s. He was living the dream. But the idea of Minecraft, if you're not familiar, is it's a a game where you get to create and design your own world, right? It's an amazing experience. And my 10-year-old son, Shay, loves Minecraft. In fact, he spends way too much time there. And Rebecca will often say to me, Steve, would you get him off Minecraft? And I'm like, Rebecca, hold up. Shay is currently training to be an architect. Don't take this away from him. A couple of years ago, we had a bit of a Minecraft disaster. Shay had spent so long building this incredible virtual world, and he gave me a grand tour, showed me all the cities and towns and uh, mansions that he had made. It was just absolutely spectacular. And then after he showed me it, I asked for permission to borrow his iPad. I was going to teach a spin class, and so I borrowed his iPad, and the particular spin class was extremely sweaty, and I sweated all over his iPad, way more than an iPad could handle, and it died. I killed his iPad, and with it, I killed Shay's Minecraft world. It hadn't backed up to the cloud. It was an absolute dad disaster. And Shay, of course, was absolutely gutted. But what really impressed me was that eventually, after a day or so, he just got back to work. We got him on another iPad. We got him on Minecraft again. He just started rebuilding all over again. And it took time, and it took commitment, and he, it took heart, but he brought all three of those things to the party. Nehemiah's story is a story of a people rebuilding their lives out of the ruins and the rubble and the ashes of complete defeat. A number of years ago, I had my own building disaster. Rebecca and I decided that we were going to do something that all Canadians dream of doing, and that's finishing your basement. Now, I better explain what finishing your basement means. In a Canadian home, you got these massive basements, and you need a massive basement because you need a massive furnace to keep your family alive in the winter. And so all Canadians' homes have a big, big, big basement with a big furnace, and then whenever you've got a little bit of cash, you finish your basement. And what that means is you actually turn it into living space. You put down floors and walls and electrics and plumbing and you put the whole thing and you actually can double the size of your home. So it's a pretty big deal. And we decided it was the right time to finish our basement. And I was feeling a little bit too confident and I decided I was gonna project manage the whole thing myself. I thought I'd done an awesome job. I lined up all the resources that were needed. I lined up all the workmen that were needed and we finished our basement. And I remember the day when the last bit of paint went on the last wall and the pictures were ready to go up. That's always a sign of permanence. When the pictures go up, you know, we're here to stay. When the pictures go on the wall. And I contacted the building officials from the city of Calgary to invite them to come out and do their final inspection. Give me the big rubber stamp on the piece of paper so I could wave it around and go, we have a finished basement. This is a big deal. And when the inspector came out and he walked around and he was looking at the work and he looking through all his paperwork and then he's like, Mr. McCready, I'm really sorry to have to tell you, but you're actually missing a permit. And it's a really big deal because it's your electrical permit. I would got permits for gas, permits for water, permits for this, permits for that. But I had missed the electrical permit. And I was like, well, what do I do now? And he says, I'm just really sorry to tell you this. We got to knock all the walls back down again. Take it all back to the studs. There's no other way that we need to be able to see the electrics. We need to be able to know that everything's safe. And so all the walls. I don't know if you've ever seen a grown man cry. Okay. <laughs> this was my grown man cry moment. I knew that I was in great trouble and disgrace. I was in great trouble with my wife and I was in disgrace with all my Canadian friends who had finished their basements properly. Five months ago, I can't believe it's five months. I just had to say it just for the shock factor to myself. Five months ago, I was given the great honor of serving this church 
as their new senior minister, serving alongside Tanya and Ryan and the other staff and the board. It's just been awesome. Now, before I came to Riverview, I, I was aware that this church had had a few challenges. Okay, I knew that. But I also knew that this was a great church. And I wouldn't have moved my family halfway around the world if I didn't know that this was a great church. But I also knew that there was work to be done. There's work to be done. But that, that's what it is to be in church. It, there's work to be done. For the first few months, I felt a little bit like one of those building inspectors, showing up on the site, trying to see what all was going on. I would notice the beauty, but also see the brokenness, recognize the potential, see the pitfalls. I was listening to hurt. I was seeing hope. You know, I think a great way of understanding our current reality at Riverview Church is this, and feel free to correct me if I'm way off on this, but in my heart, I just sense that Riverview Church right now is a church that's being rebuilt. And here's the really exciting thing. It's not being rebuilt by us. It's not being rebuilt by clever strategy or talented leadership or human endeavor, as important as those things are. I just have this overwhelming sense that this church is being rebuilt by the Lord. And I feel like Psalm 127 is actually coming alive in our midst as a church, that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I just have this sense that the Lord is building his house. He's building his house. And that, that just, the one thing I don't feel in, in being a part of the leadership in this church is pressure. Because I just have this overwhelming sense that the Lord is building his house. I sense this is a season of rebuilding. And I wanna tell you this, and this isn't a missionary putting a positive spin on things so that you give me loads of money. Although it'd be a really great idea for you to give loads of money. <laughs> but I wanna tell you something. I am so hopeful and excited for the future here at Riverview. And it's not, it's not because I'm, I'm, a, I'm an excitable person. And it's not because I love per being in Perth. Perth is awesome. You guys know that. You choose to live here. Perth is incredible. It's just such a phenomenal city. There's so much. Up the best beaches anywhere. Well, anywhere, anywhere north of the river, right? That, that's the way it goes. But the reason I'm really excited is because I actually, it's theological. It's because I actually believe that God, the God who reveals himself to us in Scripture, in Jesus, by his Spirit, through his church, the God of the Bible is a God of restoration. So to say that our best days are in front of us is actually biblical. It's not just a nice idea to throw out there to get people super excited. The God of the Bible is a God of restoration. He is the master in the art of the rebuild. Like get excited because that's who he is. Not who we are, it's who he is. You know what I have learned from, from Shay and Minecraft and building basements poorly and, and the book of Nehemiah that we're gonna learn from together over the next six weeks is that God's restorative work, his rebuilding work, it's gonna take time, okay? Let's just be honest, it's gonna take time. It's gonna demand commitment. And above all, it's gonna take heart because it's fueled by passion. Time, commitment, Passion. You see, to understand God's kingdom, at the very highest level, if we just peel back from God's word and all that we know about the Christian message and we look in at it, actually what we see is that our message to the world is actually one of renewal and restoration and rebuilding. That's what God's kingdom is doing. It's actually just one really, really big renewal and restoration and rebuilding project. And we just all get to be involved in it. Like that, that's just such great news. And it is great. That's our good news, right? That's our gospel to the world that in Christ, in the cross, in the resurrection, that our God is making dead things come to life. Our God is taking broken things and making them whole, right? And this is, this is really relevant to the world that we live in today. Our God is tearing down old systems and rebuilding new ones that are shaped after his heart. And he's doing that at a level, not just of the cosmos, but personally in our lives, in my life and in your life. And I really believe in our lives together as a church family. I really believe that. And I know there's lots of guests here and you're like, this is not what I came for. And so I'm sorry, I know this feels like a family meeting where we're talking about the family and I'm somewhat apologetic about that, just somewhat, because it is really important that the church family pay attention to what God wants to say to the church family. 
Some of you have had the opportunity to build your own homes. Give me a little wave if you've suffered through building your own home. All right, a few of you, a few of you have done it. I know there's a lot of younger people in here tonight and you're like, I will never get that opportunity. <laughs> and I, I, I totally get that. There's gotta be a reckoning. Don't worry, young people, it'll come. We'll be able to afford a house at some point. They say that building your own house is one of the most stressful things that you can do. And people who are building their own house in Perth right now know all about it. They're experiencing delays. There's decision making to be done. You're dealing with builders, shoddy workmanship, finances, choosing sites. It is a, it's a stressful experience. And honestly, I've had it a whole bunch of times because Rebecca and I have moved so many times and we've just traditionally found it's always cheaper to build a house than to buy a house. So we've been through this process a whole bunch of times. Rebecca's favorite day when we have built houses is the day when the builder gives you the key and you walk through the door and the carpet's laid and the walls are painted and everything's done. Like she just loves that. My favorite day is actually always the day when the foundation is poured, like when the concrete pad's there. I just love that. I love walking out onto the concrete pad and just standing there and just beginning to think about all that's about to take place, all that's about to be built on top of this foundation. See, foundations serve a home in two ways. First of all, they give it shape. And secondly, they give it structure. You know, when you stand on the foundations, when you stand on that concrete pad, you can actually begin for the first time to imagine, oh, there's gonna be a wall there. That's where the living room's gonna be. And that's where the bedroom's gonna be. And that's where the gym slash, if I'm honest, future storage room is gonna be. Right there, you can begin to imagine all this stuff. Some of you have the old gym that's been converted into a storage room. And you can see it all, you can see the shape. Foundations give shape, but they also give structure. They give the building the ability to endure, to last, to weather the years, to weather the storms, to weather the challenges together. You know, in, in Canada, sorry to harp on about Canada tonight, I was just thinking loads about Canada this week. In Canada, the foundations need to go so deep because of what's called the frost line. Now, you've never heard of that because you don't have a frost line here. But in Canada, the weather is so cold, you have a frost line. If you don't go deep enough, every year there's a freeze and there's a thaw. There's a freeze and there's a thaw and that's a cycle. And so every year in that freeze thaw thaw cycle, the ground moves. And if your foundation isn't deep enough, literally this will happen to your house, whether it's three years old or 30 years old, it'll just do this. It just bends and just tilts. And so actually they build Canadian homes in your basement, if you go down, there's a jack. You know like the jack you have in your car to lift your car up? You got one of those in Canadian homes in the basement, so when this happens, you just go down to your basement and you wind your house back up again. (laughs) And so it's good to have deep, you want your foundations to go deep. Now why, why am I telling you this? Well, we're entering this new sermon series on, on Nehemiah. And for me as, as a pastor, starting a new sermon series always just feels like, not a new season, that, that's, a thro- that's just a throwaway term. Then. It just always feels like the next chapter, right? Like I have a, my job here at Riverview Church, is, it's called Christoformity. It's to help God's people to become shaped like Jesus. And that's gonna take a lifetime, right? That's the reality of the work that we do as churches together. God's gonna work in this church over a lifetime, work in our lives over a lifetime, and I get to be a part of that. And so each new chapter, I don't expect that, you know, the, the new sermon series is gonna be the one that does it. But rather, it's just the next step along the way in the journey, the next chapter in what God wants to do. And as we enter into this new series where we're gonna be thinking together about a community being shaped as they return to Jerusalem, I was thinking a lot about this foundations. As you think about building, you can't not think about foundations. And And here's what I wanted to say. I know this church has been through a lot. Okay, I, I, have, I know that. I know this church and the leaders of this church and the people, this, it's just been, you've, you've had, it's been a journey, okay? Let's just put it that way. I know this church has been through a lot and there's been a lot of change, loads of change, loads of staffing changes, loads of leadership changes, loads of conversational changes. I, I, like, I, I get that. Here's what I wanted to do tonight. I just wanted to encourage you by reminding you this, that there's lots of things that haven't changed There's lots of things that haven't shifted at all. And that is the foundation of this community, what it's always been and what it will continue to be. And so what I wanted to do 
for a few minutes was just speak those foundations over us just so that we can recalibrate our lives around them. If you're a note taker, this is your time to shine because I'm gonna actually give you a few things to write down in your notes. But here are some of the foundations that we're building upon. And think about that. Think about foundations. They give shape and they give structure. These are the things that should shape our church. Not great ideas or great ministry philosophy or you know, great concepts or anything like that, but these foundational ideas should give shape to our life together and give us the security of something to build upon. So here they are. I'm just gonna rattle through them here very quickly. Number one, this hasn't changed. God is still sovereign. Right? And maybe we just need to be reminded of that after two years of living through COVID. God is still seated on his throne, high and lifted up, not running about in heaven like a madman stressed out. He is seated on his throne, the center of adoration and worship. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and to him we owe all allegiance. He's sovereign. Number two, God is good. That hasn't changed. Despite some of our experience, his goodness is bound up in his very identity. He is generous towards us. Number three, God is love. He doesn't act in love. He does act in love. I should be careful with my words because I realize some people actually listen. <laughs> but love isn't just what he does. It's who he is. It's his very triune identity. Is he is a God of, God is love. Right? It's who he is. That has not changed. God is kind. He is kind. Always acting towards his children in benevolence. And you parents in the room, you know exactly, you know what that means. You kids in the room, you know what that means. To, be, to have someone move towards you in benevolence. Here's something that hasn't changed. God is just. Despite a softening, a theological softening of God in the modern world, God is just. He is still the prime mover. He's the holy one, the righteous one. There's none like him. He is completely other than us. He is everything that we are not, he is. All right, that is who he is. God is just. And because of who he is, ultimately, it's to him that we, all, we owe our accountability. As a congregation, as leaders, as pastors, as elders, as board members, it's to God above that we owe our accountability because he is just. Now, here's the really exciting thing that I wanna finish with. God is sovereign, God is good, God is love, God is kind, God is just. God is a missionary. That God who we've just labeled is the one who's moving towards us. He's always the one that's acting on mission and coming towards us, moving into our neighborhood, moving into our lives, chasing after us. Listen, you're not here tonight to chase God. You're here tonight because in his grace, he's chasing you. Okay, that's how this works and that has not change, and that's the foundation that should give shape to this house and should give structure and safety and security to this house. Now, with that out of the way, let me finish tonight with just a couple of little devotional thoughts, okay? Kind of a couple of takeaways from these first verses in the book of Nehemiah that we have read together. Here's the first one. God works in places we don't expect. Okay, can, can you just allow that truth to sink in for a second? You would think a story about the rebuilding of Jerusalem would begin in Jerusalem, but it doesn't. It's born in the heart of a man in a foreign kingdom, in a foreign capital called Susa. This is like a Bible Star Wars moment in a galaxy far, far away. Okay, Nehemiah, who's getting on with his life, all of a sudden is called into God's work, into this restoration project. See, the opening verses of Nehemiah serve to remind us of the far-reaching love of God. No matter how far away we have felt or do feel away from him, that is not too far because we cannot get away from the far-reaching love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. I have to tell you, one of the coolest preaching experiences I've had just before we left, you'll never not be surprised, Canada. Eventually, I'll have some Australian stories, okay? It's just gonna take me a little bit to get there. But just before I left Canada, I got to go speak at this group of conferences to men all across Canada. Now, it was awesome. I got to go preach in Toronto, 5,000 men, testosterone city. I had to keep my chest puffed out the whole time. It was like, whoa, this kind of stuff. Then I got to go to Winnipeg, 
Winnipeg's right in the middle. It's super cold, like minus 53 is like the average temperature there. It's cold. 2,000, man, that was awesome. But the small print to sign up to preach at these conferences was that I couldn't just do the glamorous stuff. I also had to be willing to get on a plane and go to those remote and barren parts of Canada and speak to groups of men in not so exciting of places as Toronto. And so I found myself on a plane to an Arctic city in the oil and gas industry in the far north of Alberta called Grand Prairie. And Grand Prairie is north and Grand Prairie is cold. And so it literally was one of the coolest preaching experiences I've ever had. The men came to this conference on their snowmobiles. That's how they got to the church for the conference on snowmobiles. During some off time in between the teaching sessions at the conference, I went out for a little drive around the city in my rental car. And I couldn't believe it when I pulled up the traffic lights and I could see a sign down the road pointing to Alaska. I was like, what? Alaska? I, I, now part of, let me just explain. I would love to go to Alaska. It is so high up on my bucket list. Like, I would just love to go to Alaska. I've seen every episode of Alaska State Troopers. And there's only like 100 people live in Alaska. So I feel like having watched that show, I'll know everyone. And so I'm like, this is it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. In between the sessions, I think of enough time, I'm gonna drive over to the border. I have a little Nexus card, which gave me like the ability to move back and forward across the American-Canadian border, just like just straight forward, and night you would go. It's like, I can do this. So I pull up to the side of the road. I open up Google Maps. I pump in Alaska, 1,700 miles. I, there's no way I was making it back in time. I was gutted, so near but actually so, so far. And I think many of us, many of us have, many of us do right now, many of us will feel distant from God, distant from his work, distant from his calling on our lives, far away, 1,700 miles, something like that. Nehemiah's story begins by reminding us about the far-reaching love of God and his ability to cover distance and his sovereign grace, not just to cover geographic distance, but to cover the emotional distance, the spiritual distance that many of us have felt and will feel from him. For Nehemiah, God was reaching into his life in Susa in a foreign city. Here's the thing about Susa that's really important. I feel like sometimes I'm harping on about stuff. Susa was even further away from Jerusalem than Ur of the Chaldees. And that's really important because Ur of the Chaldees is where the whole God story really started with a man called Abram who was called from Ur, called into the promised land. This is like the story beyond the story. God's ability to reach so far away, to reach into this foreign story and to bring it into his sovereign missional purposes for the world. So here's what I want you to take away. Please never let your feelings or your experience of distance trick you into thinking that God cannot reach you with his love and mercy and presence, okay? And maybe tonight for someone gathered here, this is exactly what you needed to know, that God could still reach you because you have been running away, you felt distance, you felt far away from his love and his purposes. Don't let your emotions trick you or lie to you. The truth is that God can reach you with his love he can reach you with his mercy and he can reach you with his presence. Now, let me finish tonight by saying this. The first thing, God moving towards us. Secondly, this. This is the last thing. You'll be glad to know. The starting place of restoration and rebuilding and renewal, according to the book of Nehemiah, is found in returning. The whole concept of returning, you'd, you'd be mistaken if you think the book of Nehemiah is about a bunch of people returning to Jerusalem like a bunch of Aussies coming home from holiday. That's not what it is at all. The book of Nehemiah is actually a story about a community of people returning to God. Not returning to Jerusalem, but returning to relationship, returning to covenant, returning to God. We have a word for that in our modern Christian vernacular. It's the word repentance. It means to turn around, to turn back, to come home, to turn back towards the love of God, starting over like me in the basement, having to strip the walls back to the studs. You know that term if you're in construction. If you're in IT, you might just say something simple like, turn it off and on again. 
the whole idea of the reboot. You know, one of the things that you might not know about me is that aside from being a minister here and a dad and you know, a husband and all those things, one of the things that I kind of do as a bit of a hobby on the side is that I, I work on the faculty of a couple of universities in North America. And there I serve some seminaries by encouraging, mentoring, and training students as they go through their Master of Divinity programs, their doctoral programs. And recently, I was on a Zoom call for the assessment of a young pastor. He had preached a sermon, and now as part of his master's program, that sermon had to be viewed by a bunch of professors like me. And so like public speaking's bad enough. Imagine public speaking were then a bunch of professional, professional public speakers were then gonna tell you whether you did a good or a bad job. I mean, that's just terrifying, right? And so we gathered around this young man on Zoom. We had watched his sermon. He had given a sermon on the book of James about Christians uh, being careful with their tongues, guarding how they speak. And so before we spoke and gave him feedback, we gave the young man the opportunity to tell us, well, how do you think you did? And his response was, if I'm honest, he said, it was a disaster. Right? It, truthfully, it had not gone well. And he explained to us how whenever he was in the pulpit preaching, he just felt like he was so wooden. He felt like everyone was so bored and they were yawning and he was tripping up over his words and he couldn't keep them engaged whatsoever. And he said, he just, he just said it was just an absolutely terrible experience. And our hearts kind of went out to him. And I found myself praying saying, Lord, let these other guys go easy on this young man. This is, this is not, not going well at all. But then the student did something incredible. He leaned in, which on Zoom is a pretty scary experience, you know, when the face comes right up to the camera. He leans in and he says, but I have to tell you guys something. And we we're like, well, what was it? He said, about two days after preaching, and he had just spent those two days beating himself up by what a poor job he had done. He says that, my office door, there was a knock at my office door and I opened the door and there was a man from, from our church. And it wasn't just any guy, it was one of those guys in our congregation who's incredibly influential. He'd been a board member, he's a local businessman. You know, he's one of these guys that's kind of held in esteem and regard. And he came into my office, the student explained, and he fell on his knees in front of this pastor and just started bawling his eyes out. And the young pastor was just standing there like, what is going on? And this man went on to explain how for the last two years, if you follow the news, you'd know that COVID had some really interesting implications in Canada and particularly for the church in Canada. But this man had found himself on a different side of the opinion than, than the church and the elders and the pastors. And he confessed to how he had made the last two years incredibly hard for the people of his church, how he had been trying to start a church split, how he had been using hate speech to speak about the pastors and leaders of the church, how he had been spending every waking hour trolling people all over the internet about COVID and all that stuff and all this stuff. And in that really average, very boring wooden sermon on the book of James, God touched down from heaven, broke into this man's life, left him completely undone. And from the Sunday to the Tuesday, he had gone around apologizing to every one of those leaders, seeking to reconcile with them. He had been brought to a place of biblical repentance. It was amazing. And I stopped the, I stopped the meeting and I just said, before we go any further, A plus. <laughs> a plus, because this was a God moment. I'm not messing with God here. God preached a blinder. This isn't a B minus kind of moment. This is an A plus moment. God spoke into this man's life and led him to repentance. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful moment. You see, one of the things that I love most about God is the way that because he is good and he is kind and he is generous and he is just and he is sovereign is that he leads us to repentance. He leads us to the reboot. He leads us to restoration because it is his heart. And you know, the whole idea of repentance gets a bit of a rough ride in the modern church, but I have to tell you something. I don't know if there's a more beautiful spiritual act than the one that God affords his children to come back home and to start over 
and to have a reboot and to have a rebuild, to turn it off and on again, to metanoia, that's the Greek word for repentance. It literally means to just turn around, right? To make your way home, to start over. Thanks, mate. Over the next six weeks, six weeks together, we're gonna learn about a community that returned to God. We're gonna learn about a community that found favor with God. But tonight, I just wanted to leave you with two really simple and yet potentially life-changing ideas. The first is this, God's love reaches us. Amen? God's love reaches us. Can you just allow him to reach you with his love tonight? And here's the second one. God's mercy and grace invite us to come home and to start over. That's such good news. It's great news for Riverview Church. Strip it back to the studs and then let's get some work done and build this thing together. Knowing that the Lord is building his house because if he's not, the laborers are laboring in vain. Now, I've just kind of scratched where it itches tonight, opened the can, thrown a few things out there. We're gonna pick up this conversation in connect groups, so make sure you get to your connect groups over the next six weeks where you're gonna be invited to participate in this conversation as we go deeper and further as a community to really understand what this means for us. Let's stand together and let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word that's living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Thank you for this gathering tonight where we have gathered around worship and word and prayer. And we just know that you're building our lives and you're building this community and you're building the walls and the gates for your glory and your fame. And we're just here, excited, wanting to be a part of it. And so we just ask you to lead us home to you tonight, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the gift of repentance. We repent tonight. We confess tonight that we need to come home. We make our way back to you tonight as a church community in Jesus' name. Church said? Amen. Amen. Amen.